you're tuned in to Shake, Rattle, and Goal, the official podcast of your Springfield Thunderbirds. Osmanski, a one-timer deflected side of the goal, Alexandro scores! Hosted by Matt Baker and Steve Forney, a show that's everything Springfield hockey with interviews including players, coaches, and staff. The Springfield Indians repeat as the Calder Cup champions. Listen to this podcast on all major streaming platforms and wherever you download podcasts. In his first year at the helm, Kevin McDonald and Drew Bannister have the team in the Calder Cup Finals. Watch the podcast on the official Shake, Rattle, and Goal YouTube page at SRG Podcast. And now, here are your hosts, Matt Baker and Steve Forney. In this episode number 33 of the Shake, Rattle, and Gold podcast is proudly brought to you by our friends at White Lion Brewing in Tower Square in downtown Springfield and their new location in Amherst, along with YOLO Healthcare Consulting. They're bridging the gap for those traversing the healthcare landscape. And by our friends at Landscaping That Fits, proudly serving the East Long Meadow, Long Meadow, Aguam, Springfield, and Wilbraham areas. Episode 33, season's over, alongside Matt Baker. I am Steve Forney. Matt, how are you, my friend? Doing wonderful. Doing wonderful. How about you, Steve? You guys have a Good. nice family trip. We did. We did. Uh, made it back safe. I always worry about the travel schedule, but we it all worked out well. So uh, we're good. And um, for those who might think, well, the season's over. This is going to be like kind of a boring episode. I This might be our, our most action-packed episode, to be quite honest. Um, I will say if you are listening to the show, that's fine. I do recommend watching it. Uh, you can watch it on Spotify or on YouTube. We are going to have plenty of uh, video clips uh, looking back on the season. I also want to give a quick shout out to uh, my student. Uh, again, I'm a teacher at Westfield Tech and I teach uh, broadcasting, but part of what we do is graphic arts. And I want to give a shout out to my student, uh, Owen McIsaac. He is a sophomore and all of the graphics that you're going to see up on the screen, he's built. He built for us. I made it an assignment for him and I gave him all A's um, because all the graphics. <laughs> All the graphics you're going to see Owen built. Uh, the kid's a rock star. I've already gotten him in touch with the Thunderbirds, the Bruins. Um, in fact, if you are uh, a fan of the Westfield Starfires and you see the Westfield Starfires schedule, uh, whether it's the Magnet schedule or on their social media, he built them. Oh, wow. Uh, so that. this kid is, yeah, this kid is is maybe 15 years old and is already absolutely crushing it. And um, I, I, he's got a real future in, in graphic design in sports. And I don't think people realize a lot of the work that goes into building those kind of things. Mm. And the kid's an absolute rock star. So uh, a shout out to Owen. Thanks so much for doing this for our podcast. And and um, when you see them, you're going to be, they're pretty eye popping. They're pretty awesome. So um, we're also going to be joined uh, sort of intermittently by uh, your boys. Uh, special, want- special episode with uh, a, a Baker boy uh, sighting, I guess you can call it. Yep. Yeah, they want they want in on on what will be our SRG awards episode. So we're gonna yes. kind of look back on the season and give you our thoughts on what we think um, uh, really the awards should go to, just based on our personal opinion. Um, we're not gonna talk much about the games over the weekend because a they lost them both. Why bother? Also, I didn't get to watch much of them uh, just with the travel schedule that I was on. But I do want to give a quick shout out to Brady Deniston. Uh, who filled in for me in the last game of the season. Um, You know, he had to, the Thunderbirds did their awards and he's got to read them all and he's got to do them in a timely fashion. Again, I didn't catch any of that game, but from what I saw on social media, uh, the kid absolutely crushed it. So um, tip of the hat, Brady, congratulations. I'm glad you got in there. I know it's something you've been really literally dreaming about and um, I'm, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of that kid. And I've known him for a long time and he's put in a lot of work and effort into what, I do on a daily basis. And I want to just give him a quick shout out as well. Yeah, it was a job well done. Uh, you could hear, you know, and, and same when you do it too, you could hear a little bit of the sort of background noise from AHL TV. And, um, you know, we could hear him making his calls and, and he did a great job. My kids even were like, wow, he sounds really good. Um, so Brady, job well done from everything we've heard from the Thunderdome. Very well received from the fans. So. Job well done, Brady. Yeah, just don't do too good. I want my job back. <laughs> That's the way you get a job is you'd be better than the guy you're filling in for. So don't don't push your luck, Brady. But uh, no, seriously, <laughs> um, great job. And and some of the um, some of the things we're going to do today in our SRG awards, um, we are going to pick our MVP, which I think everybody 
kind of obvious. Um, our unsung hero, our best defenseman, our best defensive forward, our rookie of the year, our goalie of the year, our community player. And we're also going to do best fight. Uh, we've actually decided we're just going to break it up into two categories. The best Sam Bitten fight and the best <laughs> non-Sam Bitten fight. Um, so we'll get to both of those. And then lastly, our best moment. Uh, what we just The moment that we thought was uh, was the best of the season. So I don't know, Matt. Do we want to just kick it off and get right into them? Let's get into them. Let's go. Let's All right, do it. cool. Um, so the first one, relatively obvious. Our MVP award uh, goes to the one and only Adam Gaudet. How could it not? Um, 44 goals, led the AHL. Uh, something that, again, broke the Thunderbirds record. Just an absolute monster year. Yeah, I mean, how could you not league's top scorer? Um, you know, we we from the first episode, I think a big question mark was, hey, how do you fill for Ferk and Highmore? Gaudette said, hold my beer. Yep. Um, so, you know, hats off to him. Um, you know, this little SRG award, put it right on the shelf, Adam Gaudette, with, you know, team MVP, with league scoring, um, you know, uh, Thunderbirds record holder, and, and I don't see it being broken very soon. It just, what a season all year long from that first opening weekend where our questions were, okay, if you take away Pekka, Walker, and Gaudette, there was no offense, and that literally did not stop all season long. So um, hats off to you, Adam Gaudette. You know, every game he's being marked by three three, three defenders and, and still rattling off. 44 goals, 71 points, um, just a phenomenal year. Yeah. And I think it can't get overshadowed, um, just who he was playing with. I mean, you're, it, it was Pekka Walker got at Walker gets called up. Then it was, you know, Jacob Verana and it was, uh, bold dude. dude. And it was Dean, Dean. And, yep. and Abramov, just, Abramov. Like it was just a rotating cast and it just didn't matter. And it yeah. just didn't matter. The guy just continued to, uh, accumulate points, keep the team in game, score timely goals when they needed them the most. Um, I thought he would just, I don't know if we'll see a season like that again anytime soon and did it all with a smile on his face. Yeah. I mean, he was a guy who could, who could have got really cranky for not getting the AHL or the NHL call up, um, mm -hmm. kept his head down, just kept doing God at things clearly from some of the videos, the Thunderbirds were showing about at practice and stuff, a jokester. Yeah. I mean, got a great sense of humor, loves to, to get the, you know, keep the locker room interesting. Um, so absolute uh, tip of the hat to him, our, our SRG MVP. Um, and we'll bring in the boys now uh, because I think Tyler and Jake uh, had a little bit that something they wanted to say about uh, God at first of all, Jake Baker, Tyler Baker. What's up fellas. How are you boys? Good. 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 So uh, what do you think? What, what were your thoughts on, uh, on Adam God at season? He broke the Thunderbird single season goal scoring record, so definitely good. Um, what about you, Jake? So, um, the actually, Gada was my favorite player on the team, and I'm happy for him. And his season was impressive. Yeah, did you guys ever? You guys got to meet Gada once or twice, or no? Uh, yeah, we did it at we, the, we saw, we, he autographed, um, a poster. Yeah. And we have a lot of pucks signed by him. One actually from you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One from Luca got you for, uh, for, for, I, for your birthday. That was your birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it seemed like a nice guy too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that means a lot when you can not only be an awesome player, but also, you know, be a good community guy, be good to the, the young fans and somebody I bet you guys look up to, right? When you're playing hockey. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Um, so yeah, uh, MVP, I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. Adam got at, um, he also was on our social media. Um, I think everybody unanimously Adam got at for MVP. Um, I, I did spend, uh, a, a little bit of time actually uh, talking with our friends, Sam and uh, Maggie. I hopped on their uh, podcast real quick. Oh, uh, nice. T-Birds talk. Yeah, they invited me to come on over the weekend. So I hopped onto their podcast real quick and, and they were 
also, you know, Gaudet and uh, I think Maggie voted for Pekka, but there might be a little bias in there. <laughs> That's her guy. And you yeah. know what? If he didn't get hurt, it, who knows? I mean, we talked yeah. about that last episode. If you don't lose Pekka and McEachern, where would this team be in the standings? And it might have actually been a big difference maker was those two <clears throat> injuries at the end of the season. Um, all right, boys. Uh, if we go ahead to our unsung hero of the season, um, I think your dad picked a good one here, and I, I tend to agree with him. Uh, it's our guy, Will Bitten, who I think people um, – I think people maybe – Maybe you just forget how good of a player he is. I mean, uh, but Matt, you why don't you go ahead? Because you brought up a lot of interesting points about why you, you choose Will Bitten as your unsung hero. For me, my criteria, right, was obviously somebody who is talented, who has all the skill, who sort of checks all the boxes, involved in the community, always with a smile on his face, but doing all of the, the dirty stuff, too, behind the scenes. And, you know, his plus minus was not that impressive, but – when you look at some of the obstacles he faced throughout the year, um, he was really the only player that consistently traveled up and down the lineup. He played on line one with Gaudet and, and Suzuki. He And then he played on line four and everywhere in between. Um, he played on both special teams, the PK and the power play, always sort of just doing what was needed for the team. Um, still, again, Plus minus wasn't always there, but again, he played a lot of PK, played a lot of line four minutes, um, and still managed, I mean, a decent individual season, 17 goals, 18 assists, 33 points. Um, so for me, it was just one of those things where it sometimes got overlooked, I think. Oh, constantly changing line mates, um, always playing the special teams, always grinding. You know, the AHL doesn't really keep track of time on ice, but he's got to be up there as far as, you know, his time on ice per game. So for me, that was sort of the wheel bitten. Um, yeah, I, not a guy who had an uh, an A on his sweater. Yeah. Um, and I think he I think he just technically did. I mean, his yeah. relationship with the officials mm-hmm. and uh, other players and uh, on other teams um sort of being a bit of a spokesperson on the ice for the team um i thought i just thought he was super smart uh, he could fight but he would pick his spots um i i don't remember a really dumb will bitten penalty mm-hmm. you know he was in the box but it it, it was never like oh my god well, that's stupid like you're, you're setting the team back um and you know just watching him play on the ice his ability to i feel like Again, talk about not keeping stats. I feel like Will Bitten led the team in breakaways. And yes. and a big part of that is being smart on the ice and being able to kind of sneak into a corner. You know, your team is, you know, you got the puck in your defensive end, you know, and, and they're looking for breaking out. And all of a sudden, you can sneak behind the defense and take that aerial pass and go down on a breakaway. Like, that's skill. Like, not everybody can do that. And, and oh, by the way, then score, which he had probably more breakaway goals than anybody mm-hmm. uh, on the team. So, um when you wanted him to be physical, he was physical. When you wanted him to be a scoring touch, he was a scoring touch. When you needed that sixth attacker in a one goal game, I think he would come out and make a difference. And um, I think that's a, he's a great vote for, um, you know, for that unsung hero award. Yeah. Sure. Um, what do you boys think? What do you think of your boy, Will Bitten? Uh, I agree. I think he's the unsung hero. He was. One of one of my favorite players playing this year. He played really good, but he just sometimes got lucky. Um, we talked about that a lot, actually, watching on the on the couch. Sometimes how unlucky he got with with puck bouncing over his blade, or or even just sometimes missing on those uh, breakaway shots. Yeah. 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 I think. I feel the same way as him. Unlucky, just unlucky. I just. What was your favorite was, part of his game, boys? What did you like watching most about Will Bitten? I liked um, watching his breakaways, and I liked I liked his shorthanded goal against Utica. That was a good one. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit later. What about his uh, What about his celly where he 
like pulls the arrow out of his back and fires it. I love that. That's my favorite Sally. Yeah, I love that. I think he's got the best Sally on the team. Besides Godet doing the hockey god, putting his arms up in the air. That one's pretty good too. But um yeah, I, I think I think that his his presence on the ice was always felt. Uh like I said, the physically over the scoring touch. I just thought he was um I thought it was great. I thought it was it was great all season. And again, his contract is up, but his brother is signed for a signed an extension. So let's hope yeah. that he I'm assuming fingers he loves, crossed. I assume he loves playing with his brother. I'm sure the team's gonna be happy to have him back. Let's hope he's back next season um in a Thunderbirds uniform because I think not only has he made his mark on the ice, but off it as well. And you mentioned it. If you run into Will and Sam, like if we compiled all of the fan photos that were taken on the street, yeah, I bet there's more of them of Will and Sam than any other player. Because they're just always, they're always willing to do it. They always have a smile on their face. And hey, they were willing to come on our podcast. Yeah. So you know, um, just just class act. So unsung. And and quickly, um, you know, a, a close honorable mention here. And I think we we kind of have to mention the Joey Duzak. Um, you know, just I, I, for nothing else other than just his willingness and, and eagerness to. When the team needs a forward, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm sort of defenseman by trade, I guess you can say, but he's never shied away from challenge, and, and he knows, look, it's hockey. I think this was his quote is like, at the end of the day, it's hockey, and you just got to play hockey. Right. Um, and and so hats off to Joey Duzak, too. Close honorable mention there. Yeah, and another guy who will do it all. I mean, you want to rough, you want to get dirty and play rough, he'll get dirty and play rough. You want to go out there and score some finesse power play goals and make some sweet passes, he can do it. Yeah. Um, I, I always, yeah, I always have a sweet spot for the Joey Duzaks and the, and the Matt, Matt man jeans of the world who say, yeah, you want to play forward? I'll play forward. You know, I, I love that quote from him early in the season when he said, I think every guy should play every position. Yeah. And he literally went out and showed that. Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll play wherever you want me to play coach. Just put me in the game. Um, so yes, I totally agree to give it, uh, the honorable mention there to Joey Duzak. Um, now when we look at the best defenseman, Mm-hmm. I have to be kind of honest because I think that the defense was the biggest uh, disappointment mm-hmm. and probably the biggest needs improvement on the roster. Mm-hmm. And so I'm looking at the list of defensemen and I'm I'm just seeing a bunch of warts. Like this guy was good, but and that guy was good, sure. but. Um, and so I think we've we've sort of settled on Wyatt Kalanuck. Um, who I just think was very steady Eddie all season. I mean, he, mm-hmm. he never, you know, he didn't have a perfect game, but, you know, and he was minus one with his plus minus, but just reliable. Um, and again, you need some offensive production. You need a, a fight. You need to spark the crowd with a big hit. Joe, uh, Wyatt Kalanick was your guy. Yeah. For me, I, when I was breaking down sort of statistics for this, I I completely agree with you. Like it was almost kind of um, a little icky picking the best defenseman goal because we've talked so much about the defensive deficiencies, giving up so many shots. Um, And I just kind of was looking at the plus minus and, you know, one thing that stood out and the reason why I leaned more towards Wyatt Kalanuck is you look at his, you know, plus minus of a negative one, um, And he contributed with five goals, 13 assists, 18 points. So my next guy on the list that I wanted to look look at was a Dylan Coughlin, who offensively, huge, 16 goals, 25 assists, 41 points. And then you look at the minus 13. So, you know, I could be wrong in this mindset, but again, just sharing what I was thinking was, all right, if you're contributing – to 41 goals and yet you're still a minus 13 as a defensive player you know are you leaning too offensively um you know i i th- thinking back on the game i don't remember too many games where we just saw coglin you know biting and and getting beat behind he just i think a lot of times maybe out of place um he could have also been again at times being paired with uh, Mark Andre, Gaudet, uh, Malstrom, you know, kind of not always having a consistent, strong pairing with Coglin could have also aided to that minus 13. But for me, it was just Kalanuk's minus one, you know, only contributing to 18 points on the ice meant 
for the most part, he was playing solid D. Um, yeah. Because there weren't a lot of goals when he was on the ice. Yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> and I love plus minus too. I, I understand it is a flawed stat. You know, if you get a, a power play point, you, it doesn't affect your plus minus. You, you don't get a plus or a minus for that. So, like, I get uh, if you're that good. I mean, how many of his points came on the power play? But his five, how, like, how many five on five points did he have versus mm -hmm. special teams points? I'll bet that number is not as big as you'd like it to be. Sure. You know, and, and so, um, yeah, I, I think when we look at what contributed to the downfall of the, of the season, which was protecting the front of the net, clearing pucks, getting pucks out, those big plays were needed. And I think they were coming more from a guy like, like Kalanuck than, than Coughlin. Um, sure. I don't know, Jake, what do you, uh, who do you think had a better year, Dylan Coughlin or Wyatt Kalanuck? I think I like, personally, I liked, uh, Dilla Conklin more, but as it like better, I think um, Wyatt Kalanock. But I, I like Dylan Conklin. Yeah, yeah. What about you, T? Um, I agree with Jake. I like Dylan Conklin. He was also one of my favorite players. But Wyatt Kalanock, I think he was the best defenseman, even though they. Had a hard time playing defense sometimes. Um, I think Wyatt Kalanick played the best mm -hmm. at, at defense. Yeah. By the way, boys, uh, agreeing with me, everything Steve and I say it does not make you stay up later tonight, by the way. Just saying. <laughs> it's okay to disagree with something that Steve and I are saying. For sure. <laughs> it makes a better podcast. It makes a better podcast, certainly. Um, and, you know, one more thing on Coughlin. I, I think that if, you know, I mean, he's a guy right now that's in the lineup for Carolina in the playoffs. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, if you are trying to be that, if you're trying to get to the next level and play playoff hockey at the NHL level, you got to be able to protect the front of your net. Like you have to be able to, to move bodies. You have to be able to play physical. I mean, I don't think I saw him hit anybody at all season, you know? So like, and, and again, he's not five, he's not five ten like Joey Duzak. You know, Let like me ask a, this. Sorry, Steve. Yeah, go ahead. No, go this, ahead. this thought just popped into my head. <clears throat> And, you know, it, think about how we were discussing Matt Kessel at the beginning of the year. And maybe some of his struggles was what the team was asking him to do, what he felt comfortable doing. I wonder if the, a little bit of that sort of element impacted Dylan Coughlin when Kessel did go up. And mm -hmm. maybe the consistent play from a Cali Rosen wasn't always there when you needed it. You know, did he feel the pressure of man, I got to contribute offensively and I've got to bring these young defensemen along, you know, partnered with Loof some nights, you know, I, so I wonder if that element played into a little bit of his game, but, you know, I think both of those guys, you know, for as weak as we were defensively as a team, I think both of those guys had good years, you know, in their own right. But again, just that sort of, the minus one for me with Kalanuk and, and his ability to kind of get physical, finish a check, finish a punch, um, tip the hat for me. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you bring that up. You bring up um, um, the Kessel getting called up. I'm, I'm looking at – so I have my – I keep every roster and score sheet from every game, and then I, I, I save them forever. I have going mm -hmm. all the way back to the first game I ever did. And – um, on February, February 24th, Dylan Coughlin was a plus three by March 2nd, he was a minus one and he finished a minus 13. Hmm. So like when you talk about the importance of spring hockey and the importance of the push for the playoffs, and you go from a plus three to a minus 13. I mean, he went minus 16 in the last, what, like two and a half months of the season. Like yeah. that's not even two months of the season. Like that's, you know, that's noticeable. It jumps out at you a little bit. So um, I do, I think you're, I think you're kind of right with that point that, that maybe it was, it was Kessel getting called up, but maybe it was also just trying to do too much, you know, yeah. or just a lack of depth there. And you end up, like you said, with somebody like Tom. tired, he, he was hurt sort of at the end. Yeah, of the he year. was hurt. But yeah. 
Congratulations, Wyatt Kalanuk, yes. SRG Defenseman of the Year. Yes, and a ho- and a guest on the SRG podcast. Going back to White Lions, yes. so yes, let's the hat to him. That had nothing um, to do with our uh, ruling here, though. Yeah, sure. It didn't. <laughs> yeah, d- MVP is Jamison Reese. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, our next one, I I think we had a, a little bit of a hard time with because it's the best defensive forward, and I thought that Key and Washcrook had a really strong year. I thought that Drew Callen had a really strong year. I thought that Suzuki was actually really good in his own zone. You know, I think that there's a lot of options here to choose from. And this particular player was sort of hurt a lot towards the end of the season, but I think it's a pretty good call to go with Hugh McGing. Money, money, money. Another guest um, of the SRG podcast, by the way. For- <laughs> I, I almost feel bad that th- there's a, a bit of a, a trend here, but that was not intentional. Um, look, for me, I just felt like he had a stronger defensive presence. He was that lightning rod of energy. And for me, as a forward, when you're talking about a defensive presence, it is all energy. Um, it is all what are you willing to mix up with? Um, and not to bash any player by name, but there were plenty of very, very talented players on this team this year playing forward who simply didn't. And and that probably attributed to a lot of the shots and, and, you know, defensive struggles. I never, you, you felt it when Humiging wasn't in the lineup and you saw it when he was in the lineup. And so for me, that was sort of just the eyeball test you, that, you know, the names you named were all, um, I, I think had solid years in their own right. And but for me, it was just sort of that eyeball test of I can tell when Huma Gang's not in this lineup and I can see it when he is because he's just he's, you know, uh, goal line to goal line all over the place, diving to block shots, diving to to hit the puck into the neutral zone. And, uh, you know, I think if we had a little bit more of that sort of hustle, electric rod type energy. Um, you know, might have been a different outcome, but congratulations to Hume again. Yeah, for sure. And and you know, again, not a big dude. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I I agree with you totally about the eyeball test. Um, I just I thought that, I mean, everything you said, I think that he was um, a really important fixture of. Again, talk about playing power play PK. Um, you need to win a big face off, or you need to get a, a puck cleared. He could do it. And, you know, when we look at the other players I mentioned, I mean, Kean Washkara last on the team with a minus 22. Drew Callen, uh, fourth to last at a minus 13. For a team that finished the way that they finished, and he obviously played less games, but Hugh McGing in 51 games was a plus five. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, there was only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There were only nine players that finished plus in plus minus Gosh. one was Tucker who played six games. Godet was a plus Mark Andre Godet was a plus one in eight games. Alexandrov was a plus six in seven games. So like, I mean, realistically you're looking at one uh, and you know, Walker, it was up there. Pekka was up there. So guys that consistently played in the, in the lineup, you're talking about Godet McGing. That, that's it. Godet McGing. Outside Pekka. Of, I mean, Pekka of, 48 yeah. games. Yeah. So yeah, the three of them, that, and that, that's it. That's it. So, I mean, yeah, I, I think that the five on five play is so important in this league. Special teams is what it is. But um, I thought that Hugh McGing was was like you said, when you're when he was in the lineup, you're looking around going, what's different? Like, why can't we mm-hmm. succeed in X, Y and Z? And um, and Hugh McGing, I think, was a big part of that. Absolutely. Um, plus, he's got a great nickname, Money McGing. Uh, Tyler, Jake, what do you guys feel about uh, our our best defensive forward? I think Ryan Suzuki. You like Suzuki? I just think at the end of the season, he started to get better, and he just started scoring more goals, and my friend likes him. We got posters of him, and I just started to like him. I think that's a, I think that's a, I think that's a good a good uh, a good choice as well, for sure. I'm trying to find out where he Suzuki was. 14 points, 16 assists, 30 points, and minus nine. Hmm. Minus nine. Oh. In 51 games. 51 games. Yeah. Interesting. 
Um, what about you, T? What do you think? Um, so I don't really, I don't really know. So fair enough. Yes. You like Money McGing? <laughs> I'll go with Money McGing. Cool. It's a good choice. It's a good choice. Um, we are breaking down our uh, SRG awards for the year. Uh, just the guys that we think were the most deserving of certain things. Uh, but we do want to, of course, give a quick shout out to our friends at White Lion Brewing in their new location in Amherst on North Pleasant Street and in right in downtown Springfield, Tower Square, 1500 Main Street. It was the place to go prior to Springfield Thunderbirds games, and it will be come next season. And oh, by the way, the Thunderbirds don't even need to be playing for you to go to White Lion and some uh, have some of their delicious food. The Boomer Nachos, Seuss Mac and Cheese, Hall of Fame Wings, uh, along with any of the 20-plus beers they have. Look, I don't know what next year brings. I don't know when this parking garage is going to be done. What I can tell you is that the new parking garage is going to be packed, and I don't know how easy it's going to be to get out of that thing. So why not just park in Tower Square, Get your uh, show them your t uh, Thunderbirds ticket, and let them validate your parking for you. Then you get free parking. you got to walk an extra, what, block? Like, so what? Uh, you still get out of there a lot quicker by uh, parking in Tower Square and going to White Lion Brewing before the game. Now in Amherst and in downtown Springfield, the proud local sponsor of the SRG podcast. Make sure you tell Ray Berry and the fellows from SRG sent you. And a big thank you to White Lion all season long. Ray uh, and his team at White Lion uh, were supporting our podcast really from the beginning. So a huge thank you to those guys for real. Um, by our friends at YOLO Healthcare Consulting, our friend Lola Rios and uh, her uh, co-founding owner, Yolanda Merrow. They are the uh, the go-to spot for offering education, training, tutoring, coaching, and mentoring for healthcare professionals and students. They are doctorate-prepared nurses with over 40 years combined bedside, academic, and leadership nursing experience. They also offer assistance to individuals navigating the healthcare system for long-term care and home care planning needs. Founded right here in Western Mass, YOLO Healthcare Consulting are the ones to contact to help you bridge the gap if you're traversing the healthcare landscape. You reach out to them at yolo.healthcareconsulting at gmail.com, or you can give them a call at 413-627-0609 and tell them that the guys at SRG sent you. By the way, that logo that we have up on the screen, uh, that was Jake McIsaac that built that. I'm sorry, that was uh, Owen McIsaac who built that for us. So again, this kid keeps crushing it. Anyway, um, also by our friends at Landscaping That Fits. Um, I will tell you that uh, I mowed the lawn before I went on my trip and I came back and now I got to mow it again uh, because I had the guys <laughs> at Landscaping That Fits come over and um and then lay down some fertilizer and it is working so these guys are absolutely legit and um i'm sure you guys are are at this point it's almost may so i certainly hope you did your spring cleaning if you have not uh make sure you call those guys get them over to do your spring cleaning uh but do remember that they do way more than that uh they do weekly mowing their own weed and feed lawn care service program mosquito and tick control uh, treatments uh fall cleanups aeration and overseeding now's the time to get your lawn the way that you want it to be uh landscaping that fits where your lawn streams come to life I'm probably serving the east long meadow long meadow agawam springfield and wilbraham area i will let you in on a little secret as well um i have a different company that comes to do my mosquito and tick treatment and uh landscaping that fits said well i don't know what they're charging you but i'm gonna just write you up a quick estimate and it came in significantly lower uh, in terms of price than what I'm currently paying. So I'm already locked into a contract with somebody else, but that's not going to last long because I'm paying a, a lot less money by going to Landscaping That Fits. So definitely check them out, uh, Landscaping That Fits. Follow them on social media. They're all over Facebook. Um, uh, they're all over the place. So big thank you to uh, Rob Fitzpatrick and everybody over there uh, at Landscaping That Fits. Um, where do we leave off here, Matt? As I We are on Rookie of the Year. Rookie of the year. Um, I think that I think that it took a guy. I think it took um, Zach Bolduke. Mm -hmm. I think we talked at the beginning of the season about the struggles that the, the Zachs had early in the year. And boy, did they come on quick. The both yeah. of them really, you know, after Christmas, pretty much just really kicked it up a notch. And then they got called up. And so I, I found it kind of hard to have them selected as the rookies of the year. And I think that the, the sort of obvious choice who I think Thunderbirds fans kind of give a hard time to is Leo Lou. That I, it, Steve, I had the exact same train of thought when I was going into this, this is not a knock on bull Duke and Dean. 
I think they both, you know, listening to um, Armstrong and at least for the moment, um, Drew Bannister up with the blues talking about, you know, Dvorsky and both Zach Bolduc and Zach Dean. I think Bolduc and Dean have some work to do this summer. Um, and they're hoping that they can continue to progress, progress their game. I personally think uh, they will, they'll be set in the NHL for a while. I think that's where they'll end up. The talent is there and, and it started to click, but I'm with you. It, it took a while. So here, this is a Springfield Thunderbirds awards. I can't, you know, congratulate them on, on some of the things they did in the NHL. So here in Springfield, I mean, really, we saw maybe a month of a really good Zach Bolduc and a week and a half, two weeks of a really good Zach Dean. Um, and then they were called up and and really came down for the last two games. But um, so for, for me, I went with a consistent, I thought solid all year long, uh, Leo Loof, where as a rookie, with the team that struggled so much defensively, you know, I think he might have been a little late at times, but positionally where he was supposed to be, where he needed to be, just sort of late, um, whether it be, you know, uh, a stick check or, you know, just covering a guy crashing. I think he was late a few times. Um, but I had to give it to Leo Loof, someone who played 58 games here in Springfield this year, uh, no goals, uh, seven helpers, a minus eight, which isn't the greatest, but if you look comparatively to other veteran defense, you know, defense, Callie Rose, Rosen, it, uh, not too bad. I'll take that minus eight all day. So, um, congratulations to Leo Loof, rookie of the year, SRG rookie of the year. Um, his birthday is Thursday of this week. He's going to be 22. Yeah. So, you know, this isn't, I mean, he, for someone to play the way that he played at the age of 21, and we look at some of these other guys that are in the league and we see these, oh, well, he's a raw project and he's a work in progress. And, and not just on this team across the AHL, you get them all the time, 21 years old. And I never thought to myself, boy, he looks way out of place. This game looks way too fast for him. I don't think that he, I didn't, I never got that feeling. I mm -hmm. never really got that vibe. And, and yes, he was, there were times where it was a little bit of a roller coaster, but to me, defensemen that are like Leo Loof are a lot like, they're a lot like the refs. They're a lot like the PA announcers. You only notice them when they screw up. Like if I screw, like nobody listens to me, but until I say something stupid, I screw up. Then everybody's <laughs> like, ah, ha, ha, the PA oh, announcer. that guy, what an get idiot. Brady in here. Yeah. Um, same thing with the refs, you know, nobody's ever leaving the game going, boy, the team lost, but boy, that ref really was on top of his game tonight. Right. Sure. sure. Um, I look at, I look at really good, steady stay at home defensemen the same way where when you screw up, everyone's like, Oh, this Leo Loof stinks. Get him out of here. But like you go 15 games, you don't even mention his name. And yeah. to me, that's a good thing. I mean, no goals. That's fine. But for him to play that steady on defense at that age, at this level coming over from Sweden. And again, a third round pick. He's not exactly a top 10 draft draft pick, right? So for him to play that well, to me, I thought was just really impressive to him to adjust his game to uh, adjust to the game, I guess, at, at this level, as quick as he did with all that turmoil on the back end. I, I was just, I found it very impressive. And he quickly did become one of my favorite players to watch just based on his ability to sort of keep up with the action. I thought mm -hmm. it was excellent. Um, T, what, who was your favorite defenseman on the team this year? Rookie of the year. Rookie of the year. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, rookie of the year. I guess there's, so there's really kind of only three Dean, Bull Duke, Leo Lou. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say Bull Duke. Why? Um, I think he just played really good on offense and, I thought he, when he played good, he was able to score goals. And unfortunately, when he was starting to get really good, he got called up to the Blues. But I still, I think he's um, rookie of the year. 
I, I think that's you make a good case for him, yeah. T. Hey, Jake, uh, rookie of the year, uh, Leo Loof, Zach Bolduc, Zach Dean. Who are you taking? Zach Bolduc. Same same reasons? Yeah. I just liked him, and he got very good. I wanted him to stay on the team, but unfortunately he went to the Blues. And when he came back, I was like, oh, it's only like three more games of the season. <laughs> That's true. He did, like get the late, he did get the late call, the late send down. Yeah. Um, and you know, we talk about like the bright future. I mean, who's going to have the, who's going to be the best NHL player five years from now? It'll probably be Bull Duke mm-hmm. out of the three mm-hmm. of them between Bull Duke, Dean and Louvre. Um, yeah. And I, and I think you boys make a great case for, for Bull Duke. I mean, he, dude, there was a while there where he was on a tear. I mean, it was a solid, what, three weeks where he was just, yeah. yeah outside of Goddard, he might've been the best player on the ice, but yeah, it's it's. Um, I think I was looking more for consistency, and I think that's why we we went with, with Leo. It, it was just for me. I mean, the games where the, Zach Dean and Zach Boldu, when they were good, they were great. They were skating circles around. I I'll never forget the military appreciation game against the the Bruins, where Zach Dean has a hat trick. That third goal kind of called off on a on a controversial goalie interference. That's right. Again, and and you and I both feel like Providence is is right now one of the better teams in the whole a- AHL. And Zach Dean just kind of did what he wanted. When they were on, they were on. I just felt it took them so long to get there. Um, from game one, I just I there was a steadiness, a calmness to aloof where I didn't feel like he got anxious or nervous with the puck. There were no, you know, for, I I do think he was late at times, but I do not, I cannot recall a costly turnover from him. I cannot recall a completely botched missed assignment. So from game one, you just had a consistent level Leo Loof with yeah. one sort of, you know, emotional spike in that fight, which was awesome. Which was a great emotional uh, spike. That, yeah. That's, okay, man, pick, pick your, uh, pick your moments and shoot your shot. And, and he yeah. did, you know, so. Yeah. And I will say if he had the beginning of the season that Matt Kessel did, he would have been in the, he would have been sent down to the Orlando solar bears. And let's sure. be honest. Yeah. If he started off the way that Kessel did, we would have, he wouldn't be here anymore. So um, no, a definite tip of the tip of the hat that, that definitely gets my vote. And again, Barely even 22 years old. Happy happy early birthday to our guy, Leo Luf. Um, We are going to get to the goalie, but I think we're going to – why don't we just skip that one real quick and talk about our community leader. Yep. And this one is a little tricky because I, I know that fans – I don't want this to be confused with fan favorite because you go to the autograph signings and you go to the events and, you know, you hang out after the game and you see which, which – um, players are, are still there signing autographs and smiling and taking pictures and doing all that stuff. Because I think that this team is, a, does a really good job of that on the whole, these players. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at it more as what are you doing in the community? And I think, especially after talking to uh, Gene Canosa Albano, I think is what kind of set it forward for me. I think the answer is uh, Drew Callen. Agreed. Agreed. Th- this was one of the harder ones to pick because Going up and down this roster, no one can you say, oh, they just were, you know, always negative, never smiling, never, you know, high five in the fans or, or getting the crowd. You know, they all knew their role sort of when it came to what they do in the community. I think the Thunderbirds do a fantastic job of that. But just his ability, Drew Callen, with their – um, uh, the book readings with the, uh, the Springfield libraries and, and, uh, you know, he, I th- believe he did at least like, you know, half a dozen this year. And we're talking, we're not talking in the off season. This is in between practices, taking time, um, each week, picking another teammate to go with him along with Boomer to the Springfield libraries. I just think it's a great thing. So for me, you know, after looking up and down the roster a few times, I kept looking at Drew Callen. And, you know, it's got to be him. Yeah, the book. I mean, let's be honest, like flipping a puck over the glass to a young kid during warmups is great. Mm-hmm. 
but it's not hard. And not saying that what Drew Callen did is hard, but you're you're exactly right. Taking it, going to a library and reading to kids is time. That's time, man. That mm -hmm. especially at our age, time is money. Like, and that's time where you could be napping, you could be practicing, you could be watching film, you could be doing anything else besides reading to kids. And Drew Callen voluntarily said, "I'll I'll take." the role that Anthony Angelo held and I'll go read mm -hmm. the kids. And I, I think that's marvelous um, to me. The big selling point, I know we talked about it right after um, was when we had hockey fights, cancer night, and we had all those cancer survivors on the ice and drew Callen was the only player who stood by the penalty box right next to me. And every single one of those cancer survivors that was on the ice, he gave him a fist bump. Yeah. And he stood there from person number one until the last person was off the ice and everybody else is, skating in circles and they're getting ready for the game. And that's fine. I get that. I'm not trying to poo poo any of them, but the one player that said that stood there and fist bumped every single um, cancer survivor as they came off the ice to me was, I, I just, I got a real warm feeling in my chest that I just thought that was such a classy touch. And he, you know, he's one of those things that's like, Oh man, they caught me. Like, like he's not one of these guys like, did everybody see what I did? He's like, yeah, oh no. man, like, can we just not talk about it? Like, I just wanted to do something nice and move on with it. Like very humble about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I that, that's the kind of guy that you want in your locker room. This, you know, fourth line guy didn't have the best year. Didn't put up a boatload of points. Didn't have the best plus minus, whatever you want a locker room guy. And you want somebody that, um, that can, again, at this level, the AHL level, how important the community is to these team survivals. Uh, Drew Callen, I think, is such an asset. And I think yeah. he was an absolute absolute home run pick on that one. Um, Jake and Tyler, for uh, by the way, we are joined by uh, Matt's boys, uh, Jake and Tyler. Um, was there a player that you, when you were doing, when you were out and about, about doing kids' club stuff or getting autographs or, or meeting, or like even before the game during warm ups, was there one player that sort of always made you smile a little bit? One player that you always like? I can't wait to meet this guy or I hope this guy gives me a puck or I want his autograph or was there ever one player that you were like, man, this guy is like, this guy seems like a really cool dude. Um, so I think I'm going to go with Callum as well. Um, he, um, was just this one. It was also like the defense forward. I this one was harder for me to do because I like I think they all did good on in the community, but I just think Callum. I'll just go with him. Fair enough. Fair enough. What about you, Jake? I have two. Like I was deciding, my head like Pekka or Gata. I like Pekka because he was a captain and he just like, I went to give him his autograph at um, Breakfast for, for Champs Kids Club. And he was just like, before everyone, he was just being like so kind. And I just like him and God, it's my favorite player. I just like him and he's just a, I think he would be a good leader too. You know, Jake, I think, I think, um, I think Peck is a great one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're, when you're the captain and you, it's your obligation, you know, you are the sort of the face of the team and you wear that burden of being the captain. And like you said, being out there and being in the community and making kids smile, giving autographs, high fives, doing pictures, dealing with the media, you know, a lot of comes with that. And I think that Matthew Peck did a really nice job as the captain, his first year as a captain, I think he did a great job. I think it's a great point, Jake. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, a couple, a couple of runner-ups there for the community uh, service award. But, um, yeah, I think on the whole, the, the SRG podcast will go with our guy, Drew Callen. Um, we have two awards left, I believe. Um, we will well, start three, with – right? Oh, three. Uh, we got okay. goalie, the f fights, and uh, best moment. Right. Got you. Okay. Yeah. So let's go to goalie and, and goalie, I think is a little tricky because you had three of them. Uh, they were basically splitting time for a long time. Um, I, and personally, I thought that Malcolm Subban was just 
just gave up too many rebounds that led to goals. Uh, my vote was Zarenko, who I think played the most consistent minutes and played all season and just never really hit a rough patch. I think he was pretty consistent all year. That was that was my my guy as well. I mean, there were, I believe, two games where a goalie needed to be pulled. I think both of those games were Zarenko's. This was earlier in the season, and, and Subban had come in to sort of settle things down a little bit. But I, let me share some numbers with you. First of all, Zarenko led the team in wins. Um, he saw 958 shots in 22 in 29 games. That's 33 shots a game. Subban had seen 29 and a half shots a game. And Ellis saw just under 38, basically 38 shots a game. Man. So quickly, <clears throat> we, and I think rightfully so, watching it, Subban gave up the most rebounds, but he also saw the least amount of shots a game. Um, in, with his time in Springfield, I just found that fascinating. Like that, I, yeah. I didn't until I look at looked at the numbers and and did the math. Um, I was kind of surprised by that. But for Zarenko to see thirty three shots a game, let's not forget. Also, this is still his second year. He's young as well. <clears throat> Last year, he was a true backup to Hofer, so he's not even at the beginning of the year where he starts every other game with Zubian. He's not used to playing those minutes. I just thought he was consistent all year, solid in net, and you know, leading the team in wins. He's my goalie of the year. And and I don't think he they had a lot of like I don't think St. Louis was looking at him the way they were looking at Joel Hofer, like here's here's the next guy. We got the next yeah. guy. And now he's starting to make some, you know, he's starting to make some moves. Like they're they're starting to talk about him. Yeah, a little bit. And, you know, much like Leo Luf, he in March, he turned 23. So we're talking about a, a young kid who's, uh, again, you know, just started a family. They just had their first baby. Congratulations to them. Um, I, I think you're right. I think it was a little rough at the beginning, but consistency, consistency, consistency. I think if we were starting a game tomorrow and you had to win it and my choices were Subban, Zarenko or Ellis, I would go with Zarenko. You know, I, I just think that that was that would be the choice. Or, well, I'd choose Holfer. Second, I would choose Zarenko. <laughs> um, uh, Jake, who's your favorite goalie this season? Uh, I liked um, Subian, but he didn't – he, like, let up so many rebounds. But I think um, to give the award would be Zarenko. That's fair. That's he, fair. I feel like he played for, like, a backup. And then he just – he played phenomenal. I agree. I agree. What about you, T? Favorite goalie this year? Um, So, I think my favorite is Colton Ellis. I think if he – he didn't play too many games, but the games that he did play, he played really good, especially coming from – the Solar Bears, I think. Orlando Pete. Solar Bears. You got it, buddy. Tyler, yeah. you say that name better than I always do. Um, <laughs> and he was like the backup to Subban when Zarenko got hurt. And then he stayed there because Subban um, got traded. And I think just he played very um, good and... He yes. He, he was your guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I got to be honest. I think next season, Matt, we'll just scrap the whole thing and let the boys take the podcast. Go Let's ahead. Right we might as well just let them do it. Um, um. So yeah, we have we have two awards left. This this award is a bit of a two parter. Mm -hmm. Um, we're gonna go with our favorite fight of the year. Um we're going to have a best Sam Bitten fight and a best non Sam <laughs> Bitten fight. So I'll do the best Sam Bitten fight. To me, it was uh, February, February 8th. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not even close. December 9th. Um, Sam Bitten against Travis Mitchell on Bridgeport. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, we were, we're just rolling the fight. I mean, you can watch this thing right now. <laughs> um, 
just two guys just absolutely hammering away on each other. This was one of Sam Bitten's first games that he got to dress. He, he This was maybe his third or fourth game, and he was still trying to make, you know, he was like, a, you know, you let the cat out and just let him go claw everything in sight. And these two guys just absolutely toe-to-toe, blow-to-blow. And then they got to the bench and they got to the penalty box and Travis Mitchell said, Hey kid, good tilt. <laughs> he goes, yeah, you too, man. And the two of them had this mutual respect in the penalty box. I think that's when word started to get around to other teams. Like, yo, this Sam Bitten guy, like you don't really want to fight him unless you're really, really ready to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, that was, I mean, he, he went a great fight with Helgeson. He went with Imama in, in, uh, Binghamton that I think he kind of lost that fight, but, but mama is a monster. And the fact that he held in there and, and took that, took on that fight. Um, I think Sam was great all year, uh, when the, when the bell sounded, but that to me, that fight against Travis Mitchell was absolutely electric. And I, I think they ended up winning that game. And I think that was a big momentum turn there, um, for the Thunderbirds in that game. So my vote for the best Sam Bitten fight is against Travis Mitchell on December 8th. Um, Matt, you have the best overall fight. Well, well, I, I guess, mean, I guess not overall, non Sam Bitten fight. Yeah, yeah. I, I, let's because I'm not sure if it was the best overall, but my my best fight was uh, Washi versus um, uh, Joey Abate of the Providence Bruins. And for me, it was the lead up to this fight. It was the the story behind it. It was you know on on Saturday, December thirtieth. Springfield's getting demolished by the Bruins. They end up losing that game eight to two. And Washi kind of takes out his fr- frustrations on a Fabian Lizell. Um, you know, and, and you and I pointed this out and, and both agree, kind of took a little shot when he was already down, you know, and, and we both said, all right, there's going to be something. There's going to be something. And a guy who doesn't fight, Lizell never fights. Yeah. So, you know. And then the following, th- you know, two weeks later, January 6th at home against uh, the Bruins. Um, the retaliation is there. And it was Abate versus Washi. And I just thought it was a good scrap. It, it wasn't the lead up to it, the anticipation. You knew something was going to happen. It did happen and it didn't disappoint. It was a long fight. You know, I always, there are some fights that are over before they can cue the music. And then there are some fights that they have time to cue the, mu- cue the music and it plays throughout, you know, <laughs> round one of the fight. And, and this was one of those fights with Washi and Abate. So um, I just thought the whole thing in, in context, right. In story, there was the anticipation, the lead up. Um, and so that was mine. Uh, Keen Washkrak versus Joey Abate sad Saturday, January 6th. Yeah. Against the, yeah. Bruins. And as you watch it, the two, as you watch it, the two of them really, they traded blow for blow. I mean, they, neither guy really went down. And a lot of times, like if you're in Keen Washcrook's situation and plenty of players across sports, across hockey have been in the situation, you're like, all right, fine. Someone's going to fight me. Let me just go through the motions. I'll take a couple punches and then I'll lay down and then it'll be yeah. over. Um, Matt Cook did that when Sean, but when he hit Mark Savard and then Sean Thornton wanted to fight him and it was the lamest fight ever because Matt Cook was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Um, Washcrook not only stood in there, but he he's like, I'm not going down first. Yeah, like, let's go. You want a piece of this? Let's do it. And to me, that that was my favorite part of it was this, you know, I'm the bad guy and I'm not just going to let you come in here and 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 sort of one up me like, no, uh, it's on. it was on Springfield Falcons night. Sold out crowd like, let's go. And, um, you know, I don't know what Abate is. Height wise, I know he's not the biggest dude, but you know, neither is Washcrook. Washcrook's Washcrook plays bigger than he is. I mean, he's five That's true. He's listed, That's fair. At, he's listed at five ten, but he he just looks six one out there. Like he just the way he carries himself. Yeah. And um that was a great scrap between a couple of smaller guys and and it never seemed to end. So um I thought that was an absolutely great choice. Um, my only other runner up would have been Mikhail Abramov against whoever that was where <laughs> he never even, he only dropped one glove. Yeah. He grabbed the guy by the shirt collar with the glove still on and then just started feeding punches with the other, with the bare hand. Like when you could fight a guy and win a fight without even taking one glove off. And when you're Mikhail <laughs> Abramoff doing it, like yeah. that's, it's not, you know, it'd be one thing if it was a Sam Bitten or a Skinner doing it, but it, you're talking Mikhail Abramoff. Like, yeah, I didn't know he had it in him. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, Wyatt Kalanuck, uh knocking uh, Sam Aslan, just one of those ones yep. where by the third period, his whole eye was red. Hunter Skinner knocking a guy just absolutely sideways. He comes to the bench, and I was like, did you get him? Blood all over the place. I was like, did you get him, or did the, did the advisor get him? He goes, oh, no, I got him. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, all right, Hunter Skinner. So um, I, I think this this team started off not really fighting at all. In fact, I was making hype videos for the team, thinking to myself, we need to fight more. Like I need, yeah. I need the clips of the fights for the hype videos. Boy, they finished the year strong in the uh, in the uh, the fighting department. I liked the. It was a not very like. It was a slow one, but I liked the Skinner fight. I don't know what day it was or anything. I just know like he had like four punches. He took him down and like on the wall, good check. And then he just was bleeding all over. Let me ask <laughs> you this, boys. Skinner. What is your, what does when the hockey fight is about to happen, as a fan, as as you guys, whether we're on the couch watching it or we're in the Thunderdome, what does that do for you as fans, you two young fans, when you see a hockey fight about to go down, what do you feel? Um, I feel excited. I like to watch hockey fights, and just it. I just love watching hockey fights, and they are really exciting. And, yeah, just some of the – just very fun, especially when they're good ones. Oh, yeah. How about you, Jake? I – I'm not really, like – it doesn't make me, like, excited or anything, like, pumped up or anything, really, because it's not really – like, I'm not on the team. I just like get You're not like the one throwing the punches. No, like I'm like happy and I'm like that was a nice um punch. I'm good for that, like you know. Okay. Yeah. You're also not the one receiving the punches too, which actually makes it <laughs> makes it much better. So um yeah, we got we gotta we got one more award we gotta get to because these look like some sleepy some sleepy kids you got here. They right? got a shower, they got a shower. Oh man, they still got a shower before bed. Wow. Um yeah, our last SRG award for this season is um, our best moment. And I think I think Matt and I were both sort of in agreement on this. Um, Bitsy's Army Night. Mm-hmm. Um, Zarenko gets the shutout. Will gets the two goals. Sam gets an assist. Andy's in the starting lineup. A um, couple of fights. Shorty from Pekka. Three, just sort of everything you're looking for in a night that meant so much to a couple of players on the ice. I, I, to me, my challenge with this, like once we established you and I were talking and we're sort of like doing our, our pre-show production about what do we want to do with these awards? And we're like, Oh, let's do a best moment one. Immediately. My thought was, all right, I have to pick one thing from Bitsy's army night. It could have been the Sam Bitten announcement you made, you know, Starting, you know, number 34, Sam Bitten, and the roar of the crowd. Like, place went nuts. You cannot ignore that. They went nuts. Um, you felt it. You felt the emotion, the the wherewithal for Coach Bannister at the time he was coaching to know the moment and to know to put Sam and Will. This was their first time starting together in the AHL. Um, and then how the game played out, like that, you, you didn't know how it was going to happen. But how the game played out with, you know, Sam assisting on Will's second goal, um, the power play goes goals, a shorthanded goal, a shutout for Zarenko, the only shutout of the year. Um, and, and I couldn't narrow it down to one actual moment. It was just one game from start your introduction of Sam Bitten to the horn, Will Bitten pointing to, to you know, upstairs for his cousin. Um, just incredible. And then selfishly for you and I having Will and Sam on the following week just continued that sense of, of bigger than hockey, right? Yeah. And, and not to be sentimental about it, but you and I, we both have had um, family members impacted with from cancer and, and, you know, to hear their story and their cousin and this foundation that is hockey fights cancer and, and, 